Lagos chapter if you are present for them. Let's give her a round of applause. Uh, we always bring to our conferences, not to stand in the front of the Lagos uh, chapter. We are welcome on that. Uh, also, I would like to recognize the presence of our very own Mr. James Odotu, former managing director of NDPAC. You are welcome, sir. Stand for the I would like to recognize the presence of Mr. Wale Owo Owoye. Owo Eye, sorry for that, I beg your pardon. Uh, Didi CBN, where is he? You see? I can't see him. Is he around? Okay, is that him there? Let's just give him a round of applause in absence. But his presence is recognized. He was around some moments ago. Alright, also Mr. John Taha. Um, also DDCBN, one of the founding members of the chapter. You see? I saw him some moments back. Let's give him a round of applause in that sense. Um, our very own Mrs. Iyabo. Adeleke Adedeji. Please stand for the position. Come on, Director CJ. Uh, I saw you doing your hand like that. So we, we honor you. We honor you. Yes. Mrs. Mojishola Olajide, uh, former D uh, Director CBN as well. You are welcome, Madam. Uh, let me also recognize our uh, past president, in the person of uh, Mr. Chimenkai Ezeribe. We stand for recognition. Let's give a round of applause. And then also Mr. Ikani Inusa. Let's give a round of applause as well. All right. That done, let's move ahead to more serious business. Okay, um, we're going to be taking, our next paper is National Security and the Digital War, the Place of Isaka, and that is going to be taken by Mr. Temitokwe Olajira. Uh, so, uh, let's have a citation, Uber. Uh, Temitaya Oladero is the current CEO, enterprise lead of Darren's Consulting, a management consulting company that provides management system certification, organizational resilience programs, advisory, audit, cyber security, risk, and practitioner services in technology and management. His previous roles at the Nigerian Christian Pilgrim Commission recorded transformative successes in information assurance, IT governance, portfolio management, service management, and protection of organizational assets. During his time at the Nigerian Christian Pilgrim Commission, Temitaya led the implementation of programs and adopted management frameworks which significantly improved business processes and performance. Guided by the organization's core values of integrity, commitment, professional excellence, and team spirit, he was awarded the most valuable employee for two years. Timitaya obtained his Bachelor's in Technology in Agricultural Economics and Extension from the Ladoki Akintala University of Technology in the Wumosho Oyo State and holds an MA in International Affairs and Diplomacy from the Amadi Bill University, Zaria Kaduna. He is also set to complete a Master's in Cybersecurity from the Nasarawa State University, Kefi. He holds Executive Achievement Certificates in Leadership and Organizational Behavior from the Edinburgh Business School in the United Kingdom. He is a Certified Information Systems Auditor, a Certified Information Security Manager, a Certified Management Consultant, and a Fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants, Nigeria. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause as we welcome Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
thank you for the opportunity to stand before you this morning. Um, briefly, we'll run through this paper, National Security and Digital World, the place of Isaac. Um, the world has moved to the speed of light. Ten years ago, it's different from today. And I can imagine a lot of things has gone wild. Five days ago, someone called me in the morning. He said, it's my account officer from, um, from my bank. He said, there is a form I need to fill. And um, though he has some information for me, but he wants me to confirm my date of birth. He gave me two different years. But actually, one of the years was correct. So for a minute, I was like, what is going on? But, the second, um, but my second uh, meeting just told me, guy, no, no way. So I was to the person, I will come to the bank. The I said that, he just got off the phone. I tried to return the call, not available. And so, I tried to trace the phone number on Trucola, but it just, it didn't bring out any, any um, number. And so, those are the risks we face. Those are not the risks we face in our... So those are some of the risks we face in our day-to-day -day lives. People calling you with private numbers. People try to hack your social media accounts. People size you up using the OSI, the open source intelligence. And so a lot of things happen in our day-to-day -day lives. However, all these things will not happen if we don't have um, internet technology around us. And so we need to look at how far we have come in terms of internet penetration. This is um, a report by Ulsus showing us um, the total population of the world. This is um, correct as at January 2019. It's just an estimate. We have about 7.6 billion people in the world. Thank you. Okay, this is a, a report from Otsuit, and then it stated that we have about 7.6 billion people globally, and then number of mobile users is about 5 billion, then those that have access to the internet, or those that use the internet, we have about 4.3 billion, and then those that are active on social media, they are about 3.4 billion, and then um, Mobile social media users, um, 3.2 billion. Now, out of 7 billion, we have 5 billion using mobile phones, mobile devices, iPad, iPhone, whatever. That means it's over 70% or more that are connected to the internet, which means the internet has come to stay. And then it has come to stay, we should also try to review or be on the lookout. But the little things that we may not consider important that can actually cause damage. What is the state of technology today? A few years ago, when uh, Big Gates started his own company, we all didn't know it would get to this stage today. But yeah, this is where we have. Even holding a conference on digital economy, that shows how valuable it is. We have different governments setting up various agencies globally on internet, digital economy, and stuff like that. It shows how important it is. Also, technology now is an enabler of the economy. 
if you are looking at your GDP, if you are looking at what can make you, your, what can boost your economy, you should also be looking at technology because it is here already. There are different technologies out there. This is a world cloud of um, various technologies that we use today. We have the robotics, the analytics, Internet of Things, cloud computing, and all these things are the things that apply to our day-to-day -day lives. In our place of work, in various industries, we use these things in our day-to-day -day lives. So we can't hide from all these things anymore. Um, here's a screenshot of some sad news that occurred in various um, states globally. Um, various hack attempts, successful hack attempts, and um, others that happened. This is um, in Egypt, the other one in New Zealand, um, Iran trying to hack the US, and vice versa. In fact, there was one I read that um, the Chinese government they um, sponsored some um, hackers to hack the um, cancer research centers in the US. And so what they want to do is to steal the secrets of their research. And so with many more news like that, that pops up on our screen daily, we know we have a lot of things to do as IT and security professionals. What are the, okay, what are the challenges in the, uh, in the cyberspace? We have cyber espionage. This is usually um, done by states and uh, state-sponsored guys. In fact, in this sector, China is leading because that is what they are after. They steal your secrets. Whatever it is you are doing that they feel, oh, this, this thing is worth investing in, they will launch an attack against you to steal from you. Adversarial skills. We have so many guys out there that are skilled and knowledgeable in this field. They tend to try whatever skill they have to gain data from you. Cybercrime. I think uh, Nigeria also, we have a big role playing that. Child abuse. Cyberterrorism. Um, terrorism. Um, in the case of ISIS, they used the cyber space to recruit new guys. You can see people trooping in from UK, from US, to go to Syria to go and fight. Cyber warfare. Um, this one is all about states attacking themselves and those that have the capabilities also. Privacy, which has been talked about in this conference. With our information online, there is no way people won't breach you. For example, I post something on Jumia. Jumia, Nigeria, and about a week later, I started receiving message from Jumia, Egypt. So some way, somehow, they've sent my data to Egypt. But I didn't complain, actually. Information overload, that is one of the biggest problems we have today in this um, social space. We have so much information that it's, it's even difficult for us to know which is accurate and which is um, fake. And so these are, one of the, these are some of the issues that we experience in the cyberspace. So as users of the space, we should know what we have to expect. This is um, analyze, uh, an, uh, analysis from the World um, Economic Forum, WEF. They said the top 10 risk, the likelihood and the impact based on, uh, based on the risk. And then number four caught my attention, and number five, data fraud and cyber attacks. That they are likely to happen. So if you are looking at the top five risk in the world today, cyber attack is dead. Data fraud is there. And then, if you are looking at the impact also, um, one caused my attention, the weapons of mass destruction, there's also technology in it. And so, the impact is so severe that they made it number one. We have cyber attacks number seven, and then the critical, inf uh, the critical information infrastructure breakdown. Okay, what are our critical assets? We have the national power grid, national security architecture, our health systems, energy sources, transportation systems, telecom, and FinSec. Uh, was it last month that um, the US claimed it was Iran that actually bombed the oil rig, in, um, the oil facility in um, Saudi Arabia? Wherever they got their source from, but there's a likelihood. And so there are so many other news like that. Yeah, this is a picture of the oil rig that was destroyed by the, um, the drone. Um, also, um, I think there was one that happened um, in um, Singapore also. And so in various parts of the world, it's not something again. There are a lot of things that goes on. But I don't know, it's maybe somewhere in Nigeria we don't get to get um, to know about this news in Nigeria. Maybe because we don't report it that much. 
but the, uh, the news doesn't really filter our uh, space like that compared to the, uh, to the other world. In Nigeria, for example, this was in August, I think, when the uh, EFCC and FBI crackdown happened, where they took the, the, um, the, the victor's guy for cybercrime, I know. It's actually a chain, and the technology they use there is just uh, to compromise your business image, that's all fishing. And so, nobody is immune to it. Whether you live abroad, you're in Nigeria, it's quite happen to anybody. So, you just have to be aware of what is happening around you. So, this is a report which I actually, uh, this one is from Microsoft, that our exposure to fishing is going to rise to $6 trillion. Please, how much is $6 trillion to you? And so, if, if, let's say, a percentage of these apples eventually, won't it affect our economy from $6 trillion? If $1 trillion has even happened, you know how far it will And then there's a report, um, I think it's um, Deloitte, 60% of Nigerian businesses suffer, uh, suffer cyber attack. And then this is from NIPSS, I actually got this from their sites. A banking fraud hits 5.6 billion naira. And so, if you look at this business, for a hacker on his own, who is making so much money like this? It's not good business. And so, as high professionals, as great professionals, we should try as much as possible to make work difficult for these guys. You can't really stop everything just like that, but you can actually make life difficult for them to reduce the news like this that pops up. So, who are the security stakeholders in this country? We have the government, we have the private sector, and we have individuals. We all have roles to play. Individuals, in as much as we try to build our very our houses, you put your security doors to protect your physical assets. The same thing applies to your digital assets. Secure your phone. If as um, common as WhatsApp, you see people hacking them, people using your phone number to post in um, different groups, it's actually happening. And so Citizens, employees, and consumers, that's we, we should try as much as possible to be aware, cybersecurity awareness, education, it's very important. And then the private sector, they also have a role to play. They collect our data, they render services to us. We should try as much as possible, they should try as much as possible to also ensure that they secure our data. Now, one problem, which is a problem really because in Nigeria today, most of the backbone that we have in this country is by the private sector. And so it actually makes the work difficult for the government. Because if you compare to some other states, you have the government as the backbone while teaching out um, the infrastructure to the private sector. But in our own case today, it's the other way around. The private sector brought it in, and then the government is just struggling to see how they can just meet it. So it's actually a very big challenge for us. But the private sector, and the government, they must work hand in hand to ensure that we have a safe country. And then the public sector, we have uh, different governments coming up. Uh, we have the government coming up with different programs. We have Minister doing theirs, the Office of the NSA doing their own, the Computer Emergency Response Team doing their own. Everybody is just trying to see how we can keep this country safe. And so, what is the role of government in this? Because government is more of an <coughs> emphasis. Now, there is attacks. Now, when an attack is launched, we try to know who did it, to detect what happened, and then we can actually follow up by prosecuting the person. When you prosecute the person and give the person a um, lengthy jail term, it actually detects others from getting into the business. And then we should also have the capability to discover threats. At each point in time, we should be aware that or we should be able to know that something has happened. Because the, uh, the most unfortunate thing is when you are breached and you don't know you are breached, there's a problem. Because there are, okay, like I read one article where, um, was, I think it was Iran. Iran breached the government offices and the um, government agencies in Paris, and they were not really aware that they were breached. And these guys were just playing in their space, getting information on their own. So detection really, it's very, very important because when you know, you respond. If you don't know, it's suicidal. Defend, protect, put all the infrastructures in place.
everything that you need to know based on your risk analysis. You defend according to um, criticality of your assets. And then respond appropriately. It's based also on risk management because you can't defend or you can't um, respond to something that does not have um, big value to you. So you respond according to the value of the assets. And you're also able to recover based on the time you have. If you have uh, your objective time, that okay, in case something goes wrong, you're able to come back in so 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 and so few and um, in few minutes. So you work based on your recovery objective in order to meet um, the, the objective of the business. And then we're able to develop individuals, develop people. Development is key. And in development, you look into research and development. It's not cheap. Because if you even ISAC as a whole, if you, if you um, look out for how much they pay these universities to develop all these uh, manuals and books, it's not cheap. So it's a massive investment that government needs to make. How do we develop the cybersecurity sector? Promote it through research. Research is key. If we have research centers in Nigeria, uh, in fact, I can tell you in five, ten years, we will, we will be at the top. Yes, because a lot of things will be going on. New, new things will be coming up. Uh, we have teams that can dedicate to know more about various issues happening in the space. And then we should stimulate growth in the cyber sector. We should strengthen the skills in learning institutions. According to the ISACA reports, um, cyber security skill is still a problem, which many, uh, that many industries uh, find difficult to fill. And so and because these skills are not picked on the road, you have to invest your time, you have to invest your money, you have to invest everything you have. Because the guys out there, they are bad. I can tell you, in fact, there was somebody who, in one of, my se in one of the sessions I had, the guy logged onto his uh, Kali Linux platform and entered his um, top browser. In a few minutes, in a few minutes, whatever those guys did, I don't know. But he couldn't work on the system. He had to format it. So there are a lot of skills out there, a lot of tools out there that can actually crumble your system. And then we should address our security from a holistic view, from one source, having a common approach to it. If Mr. A is doing something, Mr. B is doing something else, we'll have problems. And so, addressing it from a holistic view means you can actually adopt a framework for it. That's why we look at why we need a framework. Because it's established a commodity view. We can look at these things from the same risk we have. For example, we have government agencies, you have the ONSA, the, ONSA, the NEDA guys coming in, and then you have the private sector, the infrastructure um, providers, and then the common man, me and you on the streets. We can all come together and say, look, what are the risks that we face? We document them, we create a profile for them. So the framework helps us to establish a common view. It helps to assist in prioritizing improvement activities. If we have infrastructures in place, it's not just having them and dumping them. We should find ways of improving them. Just like, um, I think it was a small um, microfinance bank, they hired a guy to develop their website and then the guy developed it and just dumped it like that and then they began to have issues I cast today I cast tomorrow blah 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 and then when I got rid of the whole issue I was like when are the days when you develop a website to pass it those days are gone now when you develop you must monitor you must sit down with them to know who logged in who did what because those are the things that will help you to reduce the impact in case there is any breach. We should understand the state of cybersecurity. How do we do that? We can, through um, maturity levels, it will help us to know. For example, if you adopt a framework now, there are tools you will use, there are activities that must be done. If you know the activities, you measure them or you compare them with what you are currently doing. When you compare them, that gap, that gap in between what you are doing and what you are not doing, it will help you to know where you are in your, cyber, in your journey of cybersecurity. And then it enables investment decisions to address gaps. This is based on risk management, because like I said earlier, we cannot um, respond to something that does, uh, that does not have value. It has to have value. So you respond based on risk analysis, and then identify tools and technologies to help, stay, um, to help the stakeholders use the framework. 
Yes, there are different tools we can use. There are templates we can use to simplify them. So the, the implementation is not, uh, rather it's not easy, it's quite easy. But we also need tools to help us using templates and other stuff we can use. And then we integrate privacy and other considerations into a cybersecurity program. Privacy is here. In fact, there are different, the EU has done their own GDPR, Nigeria has done their NDPR. And so for states to commit resources into developing these things, we know it's a serious business. So nobody can just gather your data anyhow now and begin to use it anyhow. In fact, maybe if Junior Egypt sends me another email now, maybe I can now look at the NDPR. I know where I can start. So we're looking at the Nigerian cybersecurity policy and strategy. And the vision is to have a safe, secure, vibrant, resilient, and trusted community that provides opportunities for its citizenry, safeguard national assets and interests, promotes peaceful interactions, and proactive engagement in cyberspace for national prosperity. That is the vision of the Nigerian cybersecurity strategy. And then, also look at what they intend to achieve to provide relevant strategic frameworks and mechanisms for addressing these cyber threats, securing the nation in advance of cyber attack, while preparing the nation for proactive engagement towards building and nurturing a safe cyberspace where trust and confidence are hallmark. I think the first speaker, was this the first speaker? Or, okay, so I think the speaker is the mention trust. Because trust is an issue here based on your privacy. Okay, what are the risks to face nationally? Deficiency in cyber education. You cannot have enough of the education because things are changing. Everything is changing. A code written today, tomorrow, somebody else must have modified the code. So we need enough education. In our places of work, we need to recommend education. However, we want to do it, we can read up, we can anything, just continue learning. Legacy and unpatched systems, uh, this is one of the areas where we also fall victim. For example, you still see people using maybe as far as Windows XP, which Microsoft has stopped support for officially. And so, even if you are using systems and then you have this pop up to update, what you can do is maybe create or replicate your, product, uh, your um, production sites into a test environment, run your updates, look out for any vulnerability. If everything is okay, then you can run the updates in the production server. And then we look at processes and infrastructure. Do we have them? What about the configuration? Are they enough? Um, availability of hacking resources. I can easily go online to buy hacking tools. Nobody cares to ask me documentation or whatever. They are all out there, but some are even free of charge. And if you look at the, the magnitude of the work you can do with them, you'll be so surprised. And then expanding range of devices. I'm pretty sure a large percentage of us have more than one phone here. So we have, and on each phone, we have maybe a replica of the same application to WhatsApp, to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, like that, all connected to the internet. And so we have these devices that are making it so difficult to control security on them now. And then the poor cyber IT. Um, if, we are if you are careless on the internet, a lot of things will come to us. For example, I got a message from GTV in quotes. That was three days ago. That I should, uh, my BVN has expired, one thing, one thing, one thing. Well, I wasn't surprised. I didn't receive those emails. All I, got, all I needed to do was to check the sender address to be sure it actually came from the GTV mail server. But it didn't. So I asked to delete it. And so, um, a lot of awareness that we need to do so that people can be well informed. You see, you get some messages that um, your card is about to expire. Uh, click on this link to follow, you know, just to get the information. And as you are typing those information, you're actually logging them using key loggers. So we need to be aware of what is happening around us. And then the threats we face, organized crime groups. These guys are bad. For example, the EFCC FBI post is a crime ring, which, if in fact, the commitments of people is so powerful that they can achieve anything once they have that commitment. So these are some of the guys that we face each day of our lives. We have the hackers out there. They are so skilled that it could be for grievances, it could be for money, it could be for anything. Cyber criminals, we have the states and the states, the states sponsored 
and we have the terrorists, the ICs and who. And then the impact. If it happens, what is the outcome? Intrusion on your privacy, loss of finance, damage of your reputation, espionage. So we need to be on the lookouts. Now the national cybersecurity strategy, these are the uh, what it seeks to address. Policy measure, incident management, critical infrastructure, the legal framework, skill and manpower, online child abuse, international public and private partnership cooperation, risk management, and then the national internet safety. These are what the Nigerian national cybersecurity wants to achieve. And then if you look at this and look at the list framework, now the national cybersecurity strategy, they also have implementation plan, which we can also use the NIST framework to adopt also. Um, well, I am quite uh, fond of the NIST framework, maybe because I've been, I've been on it for some time, but it's actually detailed step-by-step -step process of what you need to do. And then we can help, we can use the NIST framework to implement some of these things. For example, we have identified, we have protect, detect, respond. Under asset management, we can look at the tools or all the tasks to be done and then go back to our NCSS. In that case, to look at the policies we can, we can look at in the area of asset management, how can we set policies in that area? How can we set um, policies, um, how can we identify the infrastructure in incident management, how can we identify what is important in the CIIP, then we look at the, the Lego framework. So we can actually, well I did a mapping of, of this, which is in our other slide, so to help us to know which is which. So all we need to do is, we can have a copy of the NIST framework, have a copy of the NCSS, and then see how we can interpret them. This is the um, COVID core model 2019. COVID also they have different processes that we can follow help us to transition from not just implementing but also to resilience because after implementing after protecting you can't stay you can't just stay like that we need to still transit to resilience and what is resilience that in the phase of attack we are able to continue business if anything happens to nigeria and then they decide to just shut down the internet for everybody how do we survive because i with the way the internet has penetrated uh, that has gone into our lives now i don't see it happening so we have, in this presentation, I'm looking at COVID, I'm looking at NIST, and I'm looking at the SCSS. Okay, now, um, it's not really legible enough, but I believe we will get slides. This is a mapping of NIST and COVID, how we can use COVID to implement NIST. And so, in fact, the COVID is so straightforward and direct that it helps you to address each of the NIST domain, one by one. This is COVID on the left, on the right, and this is NIST on the left. This year we have the references, for example, under asset management, uh, I think the first one is um, BAI. BAI means build, acquire, and um, Okay, I think that's the third domain, under build, acquire, and implement. This is the third domain, yeah? You know, it's quite small over there. I think this is better. So. This is BAI 09. Owner is saying manage assets. And assets is talking about asset management. So if we look at the activities under manage assets in COVID, it will help us to actually implement each of these um, components of framework one by one. It's actually a long process, but on the long run, the benefits far outweigh the risk of just ignoring it. And another one, okay. Um, let me I'll come back to this. This is for NIST and NCSS. This is Nigeria's security strategy. Um, this is for the NIST. Still using the same identify, protect, detect, and then we have our own components here. Now, it is not cast on stone. It depends on from which angle you are looking at it. Okay, this can work for this, this can, this can work for this. But I just did this so that it helps us to know what we are looking at. Under our legal framework, we have enacting fit purpose regulation, and then somewhere under is it governance now? 
there's regulation there too. So it helps us to just get, let me use, to get more resources. For example, we want to implement this one now. This will help us to get more resources on how to implement it. And then I did um, the indicators to, um, to measure what we are looking at. We have the ITU, that's the International Telecommunication Union. They usually rank states according to their commitments to cybersecurity. And so they have five domains, which is the legal domain, the technical domain, the partnership, they have the uh, user education, and there was the last one now, the, um, the organizational structure. They use those five domains to know the level of commitment of your country to cybersecurity framework. And so, in, when you get these slides, it will be clearer. For example, when it comes to the, the legal measure, up here we have the, the national, the Nigerian cybersecurity strategy components here, and then by the side here we have the ITU pillars here. What I did is just to say, okay, if you want to measure this now according to the regulation, if you are passing a regulation in Nigeria now, for example, we look at areas where it's cut across all our components, which actually it should cut across all our components. So this is just um, a template which you can modify to suit whatever you want to do. And so it goes down for legal measures, the, te the um, technical te um, measures, this is for the CERT, the CESIRT and four. If you're implementing another framework, it cuts across two. So it's just a template that you can use to measure your state of cybersecurity or your level of adoption. So we have measures of the organization, we have the capacity building, and then we have cooperation. Cooperation is um, the partnership between states and co. So where does ISACA come in here? The domains of ISACA covers governance, security risk and audits, and then we look at the role of ISACA. The CGs, the COVID person, CISA, CISM. How can we, or what can we do to boost the security of, the, um, of Nigeria according, or based on our NCSS? We can help to converge security strategies. Now, because it, it consists of physical and data security, so we can also, we can help in that area based on the framework to implement some of these um, rules, and then to provide balance among people, process, and technology, which is what ISACA has always been talking about, to align practices with cybersecurity goals. Yes, practices are some of the processes you need to follow, some of the activities you need to follow on the cybersecurity framework. And then to create awareness, just like the IT day we, uh, we did three weeks ago, to help to create awareness and then to lay hands with appropriate bodies to develop implementation plan for the NCSS. There's a plan, but we can also look at it, not in this cast also. We can look at it to see how we can improve those implementation processes. And then user education, we need to keep improving. We are all equipped to, uh, to, to, to spread the message and help to teach or to impact knowledge on others. We need to unify stakeholders' position because we can actually have different people with different interests. How do we bring all these interests together? To bridge knowledge gaps and overcome the differences. And then to create forums that encourage open dialogue on cybersecurity. I think, um, was it Nita that did something like that recently? Yes, it was Nita. So, these are some of the ways by which ISACA can actually help in implementing our NCSS and also improving it. And then, um, in one, of my, in one of my sessions on cybersecurity, somebody, a guy who works with a security agency, he said he was privileged to travel to South Korea with his team. And then when he got there, they took them to the war room. They showed them the dedicated infrastructure, different ones. And the guy said, this one is for the US, this one is for China. They actually use those things to hack countries because they are, it's actually a state sponsored trip. And then he showed them the one for different states, the one for North Korea, their neighbor. And then the guy said he asked, what about the one for Nigeria? He said, Nigeria. We don't need to have dedicated infrastructure for Nigeria. We have analysts who use shared systems to do whatever they want to do. So it's that bad. And then I came across this, that the UK government wrote, that says only a handful of states have the technical capabilities to 
pose a serious threat to the UK overall security and prosperity. But many other states are developing sophisticated cyber programs that could pose a threat to UK interests in the near future. Now, UK interest is not actually the UK as a country now. Right? They are allies and co. And then I say, can the Nigerian government boast of these same capabilities? Thank you very much. That's why we're having this kind of training session, so that we'll be able to boast of this type of capabilities, right? So, I think we'll get there. All right. Um, um, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I believe there'll be uh, questions. People would like to ask questions. So, uh, the floor is open. If you'd like to ask some questions, let's, let's just indicate by raising your hand. I will get the mic over to you. Questions? Yes. Okay. Okay, noted. Who else? Okay, noted. That's two. Okay, two people thus far. Gentlemen, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for the excellent paper presentation. Although the emphasis on uh, national, I want to bring it down to the level of uh, organizations. My first question is, does having uh, principles, frameworks, and uh, policies prevent and or guarantee that your organization will not be attacked, have a cyber attack? And if that is not the, if that is not the case, why or how do I convince my organization in using the limited resources in building all those things, spending so much, so they see it as a huge expense and uh, since all this stuff does not prevent or guarantee that they are secured, or how do I convince them into spending such sweet money? Thank you. All right, the, yes, the gentleman over there, the blue shirt, you are to your left, turn around to your left. Uh, thank you very much for your very good presentation. Uh, it's, it's quite related to the previous question. I noticed you mapped uh, the list to the NCCS, to the COVID, and to the... Um, to, okay. I'm just wondering, why you did not do that for ISO 27001? And if, and what are your thoughts on ISO, because a lot of organizations have already invested in that. So what are your thoughts on the appropriateness going forward of that framework for cyber security? Okay, thank you. So those are the two questions. Thank you for your question, sir. Um, to the first question, does having a framework guarantee that you won't be attacked? No. Because most system is secure proof but it will help you to mitigate the likelihood of being breached. For example, if everybody comes to your office every day with mobile phones, and then somebody decides to install the Face app, there are different vulnerabilities. Somebody installed another app, there are another vulnerability. How do you control it? So if you address this from the top, it helps to regulate or set policies, and for every policy you set, you try to implement with technical control. Because you can just say, export, nobody should use USB again. But how do you ensure people don't use USB? By disabling all the USB ports on all the computers. And so, it won't help you, it won't stop all the attacks, but it will help you to reduce it drastically. That I can assure you of. And then, how do you sell it to your organization in spending so much money? Well, ISACA has always talked about value. And so the value is there. In fact, if you look, if you compare firms that have frameworks with those that don't have, there is a huge difference. 
In fact, I was, uh, I was opportune to be somewhere three days ago. And then the person just called me, he wants to set up an IT office. In fact, he had, he had already started business like two years ago. But he said he was not getting the value from the investment and so. And when I got there, just by using the first um, section of the business framework to identify, do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. Asset inventory? No. Network diagram? No. Where do you start from? So the value is there. It's just to let your patient know that if we do this, there is a guarantee that in fact, we will help to reduce a lot of things. And so, preach the value to them. The value is there. And the second question on why I omitted ISO 27001. Well, it's not inflationary. I only used NIST and um, COVID. ISO is also another framework that you can map to the NCSS. But it's not, in, it's not intentional. ISO also works. In fact, they all work to achieve the same purpose. And so the purpose is just to reduce cyber attack, to improve uh, job position, um, cyber exposure. So it's not intentional. ISO is also okay as a framework. COVID is okay as a framework. You can also map all of them. You can map them. If you have all the time, you can map them. Look at how you can also bring in controls from ISO into the NCSS. So it's not intentional. Thank you, sir. Please help me make welcome Mr. Bami Dele. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Good morning. I prefer the ladies' um, voice. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually waiting because it sounds like a um, network thing. Let me carry it out. Thank you once again. Um, so let me start. Let me just start by first of all apologizing for the change of topic. Um, yes, it sounds a bit more interesting, but I exercised my right to change topic. But we were given that option, so I changed the topic, um, and I'm a bit confident the topic will relate to everything that has been happening here in the past few days. It's um, it actually feels like a boot camp. There's a continuation. Earlier on, we had data privacy. Um, then we had security. And I will be picking from some of those topics because it's very, very related. The issue of security is um, for Nigeria itself, the national, and it's a national responsibility. It drills down even to our home, especially when we have started smelling. So thank you for all this um, thing. But this, this is the last of the session. We'll do something very different before we start, you know, when we go into introduction. How many of you here, maybe if I just show up and have this problem with complementary cards? So now we have more than almost 100 people here. Um, if each person brings 100 complementary cards, you would be meeting everybody and sharing cards, scratching, changing numbers and all. So I, for one, this theme is, or this year's theme is digital concepts. I don't really believe in complementary cards, the paper one. I believe as you move, as you learn, as you grow, um, your experiences should come with you. So I use a digital way of communicating with people. And how I do that is, for example, my LinkedIn profile. I'm not very good with social media, so I don't have a Facebook account. Not because Facebook is not good enough for social, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to catch up with it. Too much activities. Every year, a week to my birthday, once I start remembering, I will receive all the alerts for birthday wishes. I start thinking, how do I start responding to each person? Each person. I closed my Facebook account about six, seven years ago. But one thing I do for my professional life and my career is my LinkedIn profile is updated. So 
Um, even though I stopped printing complementary cards, I have my LinkedIn profile updated. Um, if there is something I'm doing here today, in five minutes I can update my LinkedIn profile. I don't need to print another card. And I want to encourage everyone, as long as you are here, as long as you are meeting people and networking socially, you have an avenue to get into each other's world in your professional area. If you do have the LinkedIn app on your phone, almost everybody here has a smartphone, there is a very easy way you can connect to everyone here in a few minutes. And two things. One, uh, turn on Bluetooth on your phone. Two, you launch the LinkedIn app, you go to your network, um, you go to search people, and you have something that looks like this. Everyone here who, has, who does the same thing would connect to everybody here. You can see who you want to add, you can see their profiles, you can meet people. And at the end of the day, in every social event, you would have met a lot of people that you can continue living with. Isaka Abuja chapter has a LinkedIn page, for example. If you want to join um, the chapter page, I think they would have, just like they did the GRC conference, they would have um, a page for this conference where you see the pictures, the content, you know, so use, have something you use to connect socially with people that continues helping you to build um, your network. So enough about that. If you do this right now, if and that's what's happening today in the digital age. People can present themselves to be who they are not. So first of all, every executive, every security person, every business person starts thinking, what's top of mind for me? One thing that is top of mind for you, for example, is sorry. You know, you think of how do you protect your business. It's, it's your, your cherished assets, your choice assets are what keeps your business alive. Another thing is run your business and you are compliant from a regulatory point of view and you are also responsible for your end customer. Now, how do you balance that? There's a cost part of it, um, there's an investment part of it, but there's also the value part of it where you have to, you know, it has to make sense. It's like insurance. Some people stop paying insurance when they don't get value. Then it just so happens that life will have it. The next week they steal their car. And they start saying, man, and I just stopped paying insurance. It does happen. Smartphone. Your smartphone will take you out of here to God knows where. And it will bring anything in the world to you. So everything has really, really gone digital and is moving at a very fast pace. The first slide in the last presentation shows you how far. There are about seven billion people in the world, and more than half of those people are on the internet. And not only are they on the internet, another almost half of them are actually on mobile and are doing different things on mobile. So regardless of how you see your system, your system is not closed. You actually have everything going out. The thinking before, when it came to security, was to have this. This was the concept of security. You have a firewall. This this red. No, you have to put in the water and you write in the water. And they have enough time to actually defend. So guess what? If an enemy understands your strategy better, they will get through the water, they will get into your castle, and what what they defend? They are in already. There is no point trying to do any other thing. Your highest defense cannot be water. Your highest defense cannot be outside your cherished assets. What you start doing is you start doing protection of your cherished assets. So that regardless of where they are, on the internet, from the internet to the internet, that protection still follows your cherished assets. That's the whole thinking. And when your cherished assets are inside and you're trying to secure your cherished assets, you can't trust people anymore. Assume what is called breach. Assume you mean breach. Assume you've been compromised. Assume that person living in your house is either never to open the door. What happens when you drive a house and have your house in the way? You need to get to the house. That means the person is already inside. So, should your car key open your front door and your bedroom and your safe? No. Just assume at every point in time you are breached. And this concept of zero trust is not today, it's of 15 years old. Uh, there was a conference um, Cisco organized one missing part 
how do you protect for the skin size? And what the skin size means you have to identify who you are, you have to identify what you are. So they came together and they formed what is called the Jericho Forum. Now the Jericho Forum basically says, let's forget about parental security. Let's start thinking of identity security. Let's start thinking of securing who you are. Let's start thinking of validating who you are. That was the whole concept. And over the past 15 years, that concept has been evolving, has been developing. Because if I know I don't trust you, then I have to verify who you are at every point in time. I have to take a risk-based approach to say, okay, yes, you have your username. Yes, you have your password. But what if your password is compromised and it's not you anymore? Passwords are today useless. If you don't have an additional level of authentication beyond your password, it means once I have your password, I'm gone. And so banks, for example, they start bringing out, okay, you have to have an additional level of authentication, so you have a token. And then it randomizes the token stuff. Um, some of you have received, you receive a code to your mobile phone. But we all know your mobile phone SIM can be cloned, and you don't even know it's cloned. So if you generate a text message, SMS, that says, have this random number. The other person, the real owner, if he has your clone SIM, has also received the same kind of message. And without coming to meet you, all the person needs to do is find a way to get your password, which is pretty easy nowadays. Tries to authenticate, he sends a code to your mobile number, but he receives it also, and he goes in. Now, what that means is, Passwords, second level of authentication, still require a way you continually verify. You have to verify. And the reason you have to verify with this and over time is because it's no more about securing the network now. If you secure the network, you know, you, you've actually, you see network configurations that say this is a trusted network. And who do they call this trusted network? Your internal subnet, your internal IPs which most times have been compromised already. And if it's compromised, how is it trusted? So let's break down those barriers. Let's forget about what is trusted. Let's make sure that for every attempt to access your choice assets, your cherished assets, I verify who you are. And that's how far that has evolved. You assume you're already breached, so it's okay to be paranoid if it's really um, important to you, then you should be paranoid. If you have kids that you want to protect, any, if somebody looks at them in a funny way, you suspect the person. If somebody comes close to what is important to you, you say, hold on, let me check who you are. You don't just assume everybody is who they seem to be. Because you can't really determine someone's intention. So you can have your intention, but I will determine if I can allow you to access um, those assets. So, let's go a bit deeper into you know, what really Zero Trust is about. And at Microsoft, how do we put Zero Trust in our approach? How do we put it in every product? How do we put it in every thinking? Because at the end of the day, as a business, your most cherished assets are your customers, your consumers. If you don't have customers, you don't, there's no point running a business. So how do you put that thinking? It's, it's more of a thinking, it's more of a culture. But it has to be very, very tangible. It's something that has to be relatable. And this is how we do it. First of all, we look at identity as the center of everything. If you have data and your data needs to be accessed, then you need to define who should access your data. You need to define how they would access your data. You need to know, you know, if somebody is coming from outside, before, you know, it's just like when, when you put, um, hand sanitizers at the door of public places. Clean your hands. If you don't clean your hands, somebody will stop you. You know, if, 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 if you are signing um, a guest form, you know, you, you write your name, you write your email address, you write your phone number, in which I even have a problem with that. You know, if you, don't, you go anywhere and you are feeling. In that scenario, when you are writing that, the security man can decide I don't, I don't think you are who you are. Can I see your ID card? If it matches what you've provided, you know, you put another level of um, security to that because somebody can come and represent me 
And the next thing is you send an email that you shouldn't be sending to to me. So it means in that approach, you always have to verify. So we look at identity as the control pane. Everything today is tied to identity. Your information, IoT devices, either from watches, either from... It's all tied to who owns this asset. And when you look at who owns this asset and you are coming into an environment, the next thing I want to know is where are you coming from? You know, are you coming from China or Russia? Is there something happening coming from those areas I need to say, hold on, let's check. Let's check how, how the integrity of where you're coming from. Um, what are you bringing with what you're coming from? You may want to be doing just a simple file transfer. Hold on, let's see the content. It could be something on a USB drive, and I've allowed USB drive. So, in most organizations, if they block USBs, they have exceptions. The exceptions are based on certain conditions. Maybe it's an executive. So all executives will have access to USB. But in banks, maybe the tellers don't have access. They see those as the risky. They've done a risk-based call to say those are the risky ones. And the executives, you just give them the access. But guess what? Whether it's the teller, executive, IT admin, security admin, as long as somebody can walk in through the front door through any of those channels and you are not verifying, they are already in your house. And if they are in your house, they have access to everything. So you need to put in certain conditions of who are you? How do I let you in? Where are you coming from? If you put that into your systems, into your technology systems, into your processes, you can determine, I will let you in because you have passed all these conditions. If you haven't passed the conditions, I will put you in one center or in one corner. It's the thinking that started um, like NAC, Network Access Control. If you are not patched, if you are not joined to the domain, you cannot have full network access. That was the whole idea. And if you are in a, if you are put in a zone until you are totally remediated, until you become fully patched, you don't have access to anything outside what will help you remediate and heal yourself. So, if you have an executive who says, I want to bring my personal laptop to the network, and you have a network access control policy, and you give him an exemption, and you do not know what's on the laptop, you just shot yourself in the foot. So what you do is, I need to check the health of the device, sir. But we realized it hasn't been fully patched for the past two years. It has to be patched. If the executive has a problem with patching, then you should have a problem with accessing the resources that are your cherished assets. Because with any single compromise, you just shut yourself in the foot. So we do that concept. We never trust. But we always, always, always verify. Until you can verify who it is, there is no point having access to what you call your cherished data. And we do this through a model because you know, what, what, why do we have this conversation on, on zero trust? What's, what's bringing it? Why is it important? Why can't I just trust everyone? Why can't I just trust anything that says they are who they are? It's because systems are becoming more and more complex. IT systems, security systems, they get so complex that you have too many devices, you have too many connections, you can't analyze it with just your eyes, you can't analyze it with who has ever caught a computer virus with his hand? <laughs> it's not possible. You know, you have systems that do it. Now, the signals are so overwhelming, you can't even go through the reports to know what to do. So your systems have to be intelligent enough. And that's why as technology evolves, you start hearing things like um, artificial intelligence, um, analytics. Let the system do the dirty work. Put in the controls and let the system do the dirty work of allowing and you can do the decision of, I will decide if you go in or if you don't go in. Another thing is the whole trusted network approach, it, it doesn't work anymore. If you are compromised, you are compromised. Um, I wouldn't trust even the person sitting next to me. Because I don't know what, if you're on a flight and somebody just keeps coughing, coughing, coughing. If you get to the point, first you say, oh sorry, God bless you. We at the point, you look at the person, is this guy right? He's coughing. You say, do you want water? No, 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 I'm okay. You're not okay, Oga. You are coughing. 
I don't know what we brought on the flight. When we passed through security, they were checking for to remove your shoes. Nobody checked whether you are carrying some toga. Excuse me, please, there's something wrong with this man. At that point, you're not doing it out of concern for the guy only. You're thinking of yourself. So maybe there's a doctor that can just check. I recently watched the movie on Ebola, how Nigeria beat Ebola. The movie is called 93 Days, and everyone should watch that movie. Everyone who thinks of security should watch that movie. The person who brought in Ebola into Nigeria did not know he had Ebola, and he did not believe he had Ebola. In fact, they had contained him to say, we need to check if you have Ebola. The height of it was, he was so frustrated, he pulled off the drips from his hand and his blood splattered on the nurses and some of the nurses that were there. Coincidentally, the doctor walks into the room at that point in time to say, okay, you're not going anywhere, we're not discharging you, you actually have a bullet. At that point, he cooled down. Now he knows his situation. But that was exactly what happened. Everybody in that room was infected. Every single person. He didn't believe he was compromised. They did not believe they were suspecting, so they had to put in those checks. And at the point where they realized it was too late. So the truth is, you can't trust anything that seems like they are. One person argued, a doctor actually wanted them to discharge him. He said, the guy asked them, do I look like somebody that, they said, have you been in contact with someone that has Ebola? And they know, you know, or have you been in contact with a dead body? Because it was coming from Liberia, where Ebola started, or where Ebola was epidemic. He said, do I look like somebody that deals with dead bodies? He didn't believe it. You know, by the end of the day, people lost their lives, including that doctor. Some of the nurses lost their lives. You know, all just because of what? They trusted in a certain way. And even the person who was affected trusted he was fine. So the truth is, I won't even trust myself. It's true. You know, how, how much can you trust yourself? You know, I won't trust myself. I will verify. I will do regular checkups. I will go to the doctor. I will check my temperature. I can't know everything about my system. So that whole idea of trusted networks has been, you know, it's, it's, it's back then. Even attackers today, they leverage on the fact that they know you trust this person, so they go through that person. That's how people even play mind games and do social engineering. They make you trust them, and once you trust them, you give out information that you would not have given out. And attackers today, about 80% of cyber attacks are all linked to credential theft, meaning somebody has gotten your username and your password. To get your username is not the hard part. To get your password, yes. There are different methods you can get your password. But there are automated ways to get your credentials that even the attacker doesn't need to do anything. All he needs to do is just press enter. And the system is helping check. You know, let me password spray. Let me check which password to match. Weak password, and you find an entry point. So it's becoming more and more difficult because now you have people doing, you know, bring your own device. You can't avoid it. Statistics show already. Everyone is mobile. Um, work from home, it's more flexible, you know, but you have your home network, you're going over the internet. So let's just assume we're already on the internet. There's no, no matter how close your systems are, you're already on the internet. And what is the internet really? The fact that you can access an internal network from outside, either coming in or going out. With that assumption, it has made it so complex that the idea of zero trust is one of the most important things with um, identity. So what, what we do now is, you know, if you can meet those conditions, if you can understand who, if you can understand what, you need to put in certain controls, you need to work with a certain model. And what we say is there are four elements. One, have a very, very strong identity framework. Have a very strong authentication method where it's not just username and password. That's, that's like the weakest. Now you do passwordless. Um, if you go to, you can withdraw money today from, I think, a GTP ATM with your fingerprint. And, and why is that? Because that fingerprint is tied to your BVN. 
which is tied to everything about me. So I don't need to even put my pin anymore. Once I can put my fingerprint, it verifies who I am. So let's forget about passwords and pins that never change. You know, let's just say there should be other means to say, except if, if somebody goes to the ATM and instead of putting his fingerprint, he puts his hand in his pocket, he brings out something tied in nylon and he uses it. People will say, okay, where did you get this finger from? You have 10, you have 10 fingers, but this is an extra one. What's going on? You know, and they start looking for who has that finger. And it's easy. Once they authenticate, they can know who has the fingers, you know. The other thing is, any device that needs to access your corporate resources, um, it needs to be enrolled. What's enrollment? It needs to be part of the organization. It needs to be joined to the organization. The organization needs to own a certain part of that device. Not own like I bring my phone, you are controlling my phone. No. There are basic things you need to be able to. Today, internet banking applications, when you install them on phones, you can't sign in with another person's um, phone to your internet banking profile. What it tries to do is it tells you it's been registered with a device. That's enrollment. You register that device. Let me know who you are. So that's something that needs to be done for every system where you have to have access. You have to have devices registered. If it's company owned, yes, the company has some ownership on it. If it's privately owned, at least there is a registration to say at every point this system is what it is. And then there is a concept of least privilege. So I talked of the driver. The driver only has the car key. The driver has no business with um, the front door key or the back door key. Or, the, or, or you want to put your bag in the car and the driver says, it's okay, okay. and it helps you if your, if your bag has the number lock. Imagine your driver saying, it's okay, sir, and it helps you open your bag with the code for the lock. He's a driver. His role is to drive. His role is not to, you know, access some of your personal items, which is why it beats me today when people take their ATM cards and give people with the pin. It, 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 it comes from a place of trust. It comes from a place of, it's okay, I don't have much money in that account. Or I only put money in there. It's a utility card, so they will give anybody the pin. And, but guess what? The person is actually accessing something that they shouldn't be accessing. Their name is not on the bank account, so you've just breached something and you might, I would say, shut yourself on the floor. And lastly, for every service that is being accessed, you need to be able to determine the health. Is it patched? Are there on secure protocols running? Are there on used services? Um, has it been compromised? The health of those services is very important. You constantly need to just look at the service as you. You constantly need to know how healthy you are. Otherwise, things will be hitting you and you'll be wondering, what's going on? You can't even link it. The example the last speaker gave about the website that was constantly having issues, obviously they did not put security in mind. And so, because they didn't put security in mind, you can't even tell what is wrong. Somebody will say, let's install a new app. But then you install the new app with the same, you know, negligence of not securing the app. And that's why they say security is by design. When you design it, you factor security, and now you have to factor privacy. So you factor security, you factor privacy in every design of, even if it's a small component. So those are some of the principles within or behind the, you never trust, but you always have to verify. And there are different scenarios that follow those principles. So we've, we've talked of the different scenarios. Um, you know, employees should be able to enroll their devices they should have that ability to enroll the devices. Security organizations should be able to enforce you know, health checks. If I want to check the state of, I want to know my patch compliance of every system in my organization, it shouldn't be a big deal. If the devices are enrolled, you would know. If the devices are not enrolled and you just allow anything coming, it will be difficult for you to tell your patch compliance, for example. If a new security update has been released and you cannot tell 
if it has 100% coverage in your organization. Then it means you have entities in your organization that you don't know about. And so the whole idea of enrollment is know what you have. That's, that's the whole concept. If somebody is living in your house, I'm sure you want to know who the person is. If you come home and you see somebody you've never seen before, you first look around, who brought this person in? You know, I, I go home one day and uh, I, was, I was knocking nobody. I wanted to open the door, it was locked from inside. But through the window, I saw a lady in the sitting room. And I could tell she was the lady who came to fix my daughter's hair. Yeah, I, I, she was one, but nobody told me she was coming. I got to the window, I had no, she had no sense of urgency to open the door. She was just comfortable sitting in the sitting room. Let me get this place. <laughs> so I said, okay, um, I knocked on the window. I don't know who she is. She doesn't even know who I am. In my mind, I was like, so this is my house. It's strange. If nobody told me somebody was coming, I should be worried. If I get there and the person cannot know that I'm the one, I should be worried. Because it is your house, it is your space, it is your data. You should know everyone that interacts with your data. So I could have taken a drastic approach. Um, hello, madam, please, can you first step outside? Yes, yeah. no offense. And then, when somebody next time, you know, just let me know. So you saved everybody the headache. And then when you have guests, so that was the scenario I just mentioned. When you have guests, now a lot of estates are doing uh, visitor park system. It's good. It means when somebody comes to visit you in your house, there is a trail in which even the security can go back one week ago to say, this person came last week. This person has visited five people in the past one week. In fact, there was a security incident last month, and it just so happens this security incident happened. These are the visitors that came into the estate. There is one name that is just showing up every time. So the whole idea is there has to be a process for guests, there has to be a process for people coming from outside. And there also has to be a process for employees who say, I want to access company resources without managed devices. Yes, there should be a process for that. Because in some cases, you need to be able to access company resources from outside. So if I use the same scenario of internet banking, what you need to do is you log in, but to do any authentication, you need your hardware token. Maybe before on your phone, you have to use fingerprint or eye recognition. Now you need to use the hardware token that was given to you in the bank, they won't transfer it to you, you pick it up yourself. You know, so for that kind of access, you should be able to have a process that, that covers you for that. So this is how it used to be before, when there was no zero trust. Um, you didn't need to register devices. One password was enough, no, no, no additional level of authentication was required. And then, you could not even do enforcement. How do you enforce? Already they are coming in, going out. You have no control. But now with the idea of implementing zero trust or implementing the thinking of zero trust, you can verify the identity. You can verify the health of the device that is connecting to your data, connecting to your system, because you have them enrolled. And you can also verify the health of those services. So at every point in time, you can say, um, this system has unsecure protocols, and it means it could be, you know, they are vulnerable and they could be exploited. So you constantly do improvement on even the health of your services. So, um, this is rounding up. The strategy around zero trust is first of all to be able to have signals. So for everything that is happening in your environment, you receive the alert and it's categorized. You know what is what. Um, you can say this is the threat to my environment, this is what has affected my environment. You should be able to make a decision based on it. So what happens when a device, somebody is trying to log on from an external network that is not trusted? 
Uh, you say enforce multi-factor authentication. So it asks you for another level of authentication to tell who you are. You should be able to have that ability to make a decision. And then the last thing is you should be able to make enforcement. If tomorrow you need to say, I'm changing, I'm, I'm strengthening my security policies, whatever enforcement you have should be able to apply to every endpoint or every device. So it's that kind of strategy we, are, we use in our approach um, for zero trust. And we can bring you home back to you know the concept of the house. You know, you, you make phone calls in a taxi, talking about personal things, and somebody is hearing what you should not be hearing. It's as good as just carry a microphone and be. And I trip when I see people making phone calls on speaker information against you. So back to my, how do I see? You know how people use social media. They post everything about their life. They post their location. They post everything. And then you wonder how people can get to you and exploit um, your weaknesses. So these are the priorities. It's all wrapped around what we've, what we've discussed before. Um, you need to have a strategy um, for segmentation. Forget the whole perimeter approach. That thing doesn't work. It doesn't apply anymore, especially to um, coming in an attacker's um, mindset. And then your, your security has to be identity-based. It has to come down to eventually identifying who is this and how does the person um, access. And network architectures need to change. You, know, you, can't, you can't go with the moat and castle approach anymore. You have to change that approach because that approach just does not protect the conversation. That's the whole concept of the research. Thank you very much, uh, Baron Jelly, for that presentation. You have enlightened us a lot. And uh, uh, my question is a lot of uh, vulnerabilities to corporate networks come through the big guns. Uh, a guy doesn't need to know about this. Uh, you cannot touch his computer. You cannot, uh, if, if you want to, I uh, find it difficult to, to use devices. Let him do what he wants to do. How do we handle that? Because uh, a lot of uh, our analysis have shown that it is the top. They don't want to be, they don't want to pass through security. And they want to be secure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Very nice sir. Um, my question is this. We use different platforms. We are, yeah, we are exposed to different platforms like social media, and then our banking services, and even the ISAC. And there are apps that manage passwords. I have one app that uh, consolidates all the passwords and management data. What do you feel about sort of such apps? Or maybe you have a central password or management app? Someone passed away, and people were lamenting that if he had left his ATM pin number with the wife, at least they would have been able to withdraw money for immediate uh, upkeep. How do we marry them? <laughs> zero uh, zero trust. Thank you. Interesting uh, presentation. I'm concerned about zero trust and network segmentation from the whole project. That's different from what you guys said. The proliferation of uh, devices now, my major concern is smart TVs. Um, and then people that install home security systems that are accessible over the internet. Can you comment on whether, I mean, the pros and cons of this, and then is it possible to implement any sort of network segmentation in your home, given the kind of devices we use nowadays? Okay, thank you. Executives, um, they are the ones who don't want change. They are the ones who don't want to be touched, who want to be disturbed. And they are also the ones who everybody is scared of to tell the truth. So there's an approach, you know, uh, a few days ago where with a customer and the, ex the chairman could not access his email and his account kept being locked out. First thing is, you have a monitoring system to understand what's happening. And immediately you see what's happening, you can tell, oh, sir, your password has expired. So you need to change your password. That's one. That comes under education. Somebody should be able to tell them exactly as it is. 
and they should constantly be educated because they are the most likely people who will be compromised. They are the ones who would go out, you know, it's easy to even know what their email address, so they will receive that targeted email. It's not even a phishing email, it's a targeted email. They need to know how to act, so education is very key. And then the second thing is, in this scenario I just told you about, what the administrator did was he, he did the opposite of a security policy that was enforced. So he marked his password never to expire. He changed the password and he marked it never to expire. Big problem. Because if that password is owned or compromised, obviously they are not monitoring. We've already seen it. They couldn't even tell the password was expired. They found out it was expired, they changed the password, they marked it as never to expire. So the attacker or an attacker would be sharing password with the yoga. And what does that say? They will be accessing everything he should access. So what we do in this case is they need to know the risk of every security violation. And the risk basically is, um, sir, if it is very important to you, we need to protect it. You've seen how they do US presidents. When there is an issue, when there is a risk, they don't look at the president as they will bundle the man, his leg won't touch the ground, they carry him and move. He doesn't need to say, I don't want to move. And that's exactly what you do in a crisis situation. They, it's not them you look at, it's what the risk exposure is to them and to everything they stand for that you look at. So I would say education is very, very key. And education is continuous. And then secondly, they need to know what the risk is. They could say, I don't want to. You say, sir, you can agree not to, but this is the risk. Accept it. If the risk does materialize, we know you accepted it. There is no point coming back asking how did it happen. So for executives, I think those two things are key for them. Education and also awareness, um, risk awareness. Uh, let me go to the second question. Passwords. If you do... If you do um, health checks on systems, you would find some applications that even transmit passwords in clear text. You have a secure system, you have people with complex passwords, and then you have an application that is processing the password, and it, it, can, be, it can be seen by a sniffer, a snooper, or anything. So, nothing wrong with having a password management solution, but one of the risks of passwords is an attacker doesn't need to see that your password is p at ssw0rd1 asterisk god knows what. No, no, no. With passwords, there are ways to decrypt passwords. And what you have to protect is those systems that store passwords. You have to ensure those systems have the ability not to decrypt the passwords they are storing. And any strong password management solution or authentication solution will never send passwords in a form that is readable, even from the system. Because a lot of times when you do authentication with passwords, you are not authenticating with what the user has typed. It's the hash of the password. The hash of the password is not readable. The human eyes cannot interpret it. So, strong passwords and the systems that manage passwords have to manage passwords in a way that it's not readable. So check with those systems. If they do not meet that criteria of can I steal the passwords from those password management systems? If the answer is yes, if it's stealable, then you shouldn't have those systems in place. So nothing wrong with password management solutions, but they shouldn't be vulnerable to have those passwords readable. Um, ATM thing. I think so. In this case, banks do something. Uh, next of kin. You have a next of kin, a registered next of kin. Um, what that says is, in the event of my demise, in the event of my unavailability, there is somebody else who automatically inherits the um, ability to access my funds. I think that in a way solves it. So if in this situation, um, and it happens all the time. If, if the wife does not have a way to access the funds in, in the man's damage, then one needs to question what exactly was put in place. Is it that she 
was not his next of kin, um, was somebody else the next of kin. Um, but if, if, if the ATM is not the only channel to take money. So in that situation, there has to be a case where the bank can be contacted and it triggers the process of, they have that process of what happens when the person is not available anymore. Um, and it always defaults to either the signatories or the next of kin. Um, so I think that would address the issue of, you know, that's not, I, I won't be giving my wife my pin because if I die she should access my money, no. I would most likely be giving her my pin number because um, I trust that, you know, she will use it and I trust it's secure. And what's the worst that will happen? <laughs> You have your husband's thing. <laughs> uh, for smart TVs, connected systems, um, so most most identity providers are most uh, most technology providers that give you access to smart TVs, it's all embedded in a couple of things. It's an operating system. Uh, the, the health of the operating system needs to be known. But there's an easy way to even determine and help with connected devices and segmentation. Because with a zero trust approach, you are focused on identity. It means at every point you need to access anything, it needs to do a verification of the identity. So if you have a smart TV and it's connected to a, maybe a cloud provider service, let's assume it, it has Android and you sign in with your um, Google account. It means every sign-in activity from your Google account is visible. It means at the point where you are going to use your identity on that smart TV, you would have gone through a verification process. It also means you have control over the devices that are connected to your identity. So it still follows the whole zero trust approach. As long as it's a connected device, because it's tied to the identity, you can control the identity, you can revoke the identity, and you can also check the health of the device. So I'm very aware that most cloud providers, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they also do the same zero trust approach where you enroll the device, so that smart TV is enrolled, and you can verify the device health, and if there's an unusual signing activity, you get notified. And you can also see it on the portal to see the unusual signing activity. All because it's tied to the identity. So that's, that's it for the question. I'll just look at the time, I'll just about short by three minutes. Thank you. Did well? Yeah. Well, let's give you a round of applause. Mrs. 
Lydia, Ifa Ejiko Alpha. Uh, Ifa Ejiko Alpha, is she here? Thank for recognition. Let's give her a round of applause. I also like to recognize uh, Mr. Babatunde Sadiglu, former director of CBS. Welcome. And then I would like to recognize as well Mrs. Chiaka Koi, director of FIRS. Stand for the Mr. Madam. Thank you for honoring our conference and honoring us with your presence. Of course, I will. I'd as well like to recognize Mr. Okpeyemi Olifade, past president. Please stand for the position. Let's give him a round of applause. He did so well for the chapter. All right. So, are the raffle draw tickets going round? Um, I expect good. Okay. How many ushers are there? Do we have doing that? Okay. Do that briskly. Do that briskly. Okay. One ticket each. Don't take more than. Don't take more than one. Um, how do we guard against not taking more than one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> zero trust. <laughs> Are we good? Briskly, briskly. Um, officials are not allowed to take so. Point of order. <laughs> so that, uh, that's already a conflict of interest. So, so. In addition to that, members of the conference planning committee are also not allowed. Yeah. So you are automatically exempt. Right? Okay, are we almost done? Yeah, are we almost there? You can see the ushers going out, meaning that we are done. Has everybody picked? Everybody picked? All right, so we are done. Please go to the auditor so that the rest can be destroyed. All right. Okay. So um, at this point, we'll take a we'll take a, a five minute comfort break, just for the purpose of those that have not registered to do so. So please let's uh, do well to register. And then after that, we'll, 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 we'll,
to have the presentation, our next presentation. Five minutes comfort break. Please, those that have not registered, use the opportunity to do so. Strategy and process optimization experts with over 20 years professional experience cutting across IT, telecommunications, international NGO, international consulting firms, and broadcast and media, Henry Ayo regularly provides management and business advisory services to organizations in the public and private sector spaces. His extensive work experience spans Africa, Europe, and China. Previously, he worked with the NTA Star TV Network Limited as the Director of Human Resources. Henry had also worked with KPMG Professional Services as a middle-level management staff. He served as the head of Servicom Institute and also worked at MTN Nigeria in various capacities. A prolific and impactful convention and conference speaker, Henry has gathered more than 1,000 hours of professional speaking experience in the last 20 years. He has a postgraduate degree in management from the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom and a first degree in the Biological Sciences from the University of Calabar in Nigeria. He is a certified Six Sigma professional with in-depth implementation and training experience of the methodology. Henry is also an internationally certified Deloitte and Touche facilitator and a member of the United Kingdom's Chartered Institute of Management Consulting. He brings to bear years of sales, training and human resources management experience gathered across various multinational organizations. Thank you very much. Let's make welcome Mr. Henry Ayo. Let's give a round of applause. For a moment, I was looking around for him. He was there, hiding somewhere. All right, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm sure um, it's been a great um, session we've had so far. Yes or yes? And you know, people are not answering so much because I guess the aroma from our days is beginning to interfere with the, you know, with us here. But never mind, I'm not going to spend too much, wouldn't take too much of your time, but I just want to share, you know, certain things which a lot of us are used to, a lot of us know. Uh, but truth is, or the question I would ask is, how many of us get to um, practice some of these things? So during the course of my session, I'm not going to say anything you've never heard before. I'm not going to say anything you don't know. I'm not going to say any concept or share any concept, knowledge or idea that you haven't read, you haven't, you know, been conversant with. But the question I would need to ask you is this. How many of those concepts have you actually practicalized and realized results from? Because it's not in what's you know, but what you do with what you know. And therefore, do not see them as, oh, well, I know this thing, but ask yourself a question. How much of this am I currently utilizing? How much of this am I currently practicing in my place of work? And that brings me to um, a philosophy, an African philosophy, which a lot of people are estranged from, you know, in these days and time. In those days, growing up, Every child in the community was everyone's child, true or false. You know, I remember growing up and um, I got into a fight, you know, trying to, on a lighter note, um, I'm not a violent person, don't, don't, as you can see, I'm, I'm gentle. I got into a, fi a, a fight with a, a girl in the school and her uniform got torn. Guess what happened? I was sent home. <laughs> Luckily for me, the school wasn't far from uh, where I live, at primary school. As I was walking through on the street, because they said, take her to your house, let them go and saw you to come back. And on the, way, on, the way, on the way home, right from the first story building, the next door neighbor, shouted my name. Hey, what are you doing? Where are you coming from? And you know what she did? Because my friend had gone to work. She got the girl, she said, okay, go to Auntie So and So house across the road. They got her uniform sewn. She went back to school, when your parents come back, guess what? We'll deal with this matter. But in this day and age, do we see those things happening? Not anymore. We've lost that Africanness about us as a people. 
and uh, we're now trying to adopt other philosophies, other culture that are not African. And what am I trying to talk to you about right now, before I go into my slide, is a philosophy called Ubuntu. How many of us have heard about the philosophy of Ubuntu? And therefore, before I commence my session about work, human relations in the workplace, I will read something from um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and listen to this. It says, a person is a person. This is the Ubuntu philosophy. A person is a person through other persons. That means whatever you are today, someone actually helped you up. None of us comes into the world fully formed. We will not know how to think, or walk, or speak, or behave as human beings unless we learnt it from other human beings. We need other human beings in order to be human. A quote by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And that's the whole philosophy of the Ubuntu philosophy. And I would also want to ask you a question. When I say to anyone here, how many hours do you spend at work in a day? Most of you want to tell me, well, um, I spend from about, if you resume by 8, you say 8 to 5 or 8 to 4. If you resume by, say, um, 9 o'clock or 8.30, you say that's the length of time you work. But the truth of the matter is this. You actually resume work before you resume work. Yes or yes? Yes. yes. Please, let's make it very interactive. Yes or yes? Yes. yes. The moment you, your foot or your feet hit the floor and you get up, you walk into the shower, work has started. Yes or yes? Yes. True or true? true. What are you beginning to think about? You're thinking about that boss you don't like, that, coach, <laughs> that very annoying colleague of yours, or that report, you're still thinking of how to put the things together. Yes or yes? Yes. So work has started. And when you close work, is it 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5.30, or what time do you close work? Even if you close late and you leave the office by 9 p.m., that isn't when you close. You know when you close. When do you close work? When you lay on the bed and when you doze off, then you close. So on a more serious note, on a serious note, work starts way before you hit, sit your behind on your chair, and work closes oftentimes when your eyes shut and you're in la la la. And you're dreaming about those colleagues you're fighting, and you're, you extend that fight into the prison. <laughs> and then, when you go to church, they tell you what, you know, some people are pursuing you, you need to go for deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the truth about life is, life can be fun. And why did I ask you about how much time you spend at work? The reason why I ask you about how much time you spend at work is still, still, still boils down to the concept of human relations at work. Why? For the most part, most of us spend on average over 12 hours of work. Now, in the last seven days, how many of you have spent an active 12 hours with your children, with your spouses, with your, some guys say, don't say, don't say, I'll say, with your side chick. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> how many of us have spent that little time with them? None of you have. But guess what? That person sitting next to you at work, your boss, your colleague, and so on and so forth, everyone in your work community, you spend an awful lot of time with them. A huge amount of your time is spent where? In the workplace. And therefore, if the workplace is ugly, toxic, not very friendly, you're going to die very soon. Yes or yes? Yes. Truth is, I know people who've actually you know, lost their life or died because of certain ailments that originated from a toxic work environment. And therefore, we're going to look at why human relations in the workplace is of utmost importance. We can't afford not to have, you know, um, positive, impactful, fruitful human um, relations in our places of work. And I'll try as much as possible to um, cover what I've outlined um, there. Um, so I'm going to be looking at, uh, one minute please, the technology is playing a trick on me right now. I think the laptop has gone, but I'll go with this screen. Now, okay, now if I'm going to be looking at um, understanding human relations, I haven't said all the things I've said. Understanding human relations in the workplace, the main, what's the main goal of human relations in the workplace? We're going to be looking at critical human relations skills, 
We're going to be looking at how to improve human relations in the workplace. Emotional intelligence as a bedrock. I know earlier on in the morning, um, someone talked about emotional intelligence, but I'm going to be looking at two dimensions of emotional intelligence and how it serves as a bedrock in ensuring fruitful, productive, positive human relations at work. And also importance of human relations in the workplace. And then the six factors that make a great team. You know why? Reason is, most of us here, or some of us here, are top management professionals. And the rest of us here are middle level professionals. The bulk of the people sitting here, in some way or another, either micro or macro, you impact decisions in your place of work. Yes or yes? Absolutely. And therefore, it will walk away, not just with the knowledge, but with actionable plans on how you can improve the work community, the relationship, the interpersonal dynamics in your place of work. You would have done you know, a great deal of good to your organization. Now, I mean, if you look at this picture, I don't know how clear it is. On one hand, you find a team that is what having what you call harmony, and then the other team having what is called a state of disharmony. Why? Because of a couple of things that have not been um, ironed out. Now, looking at a quote from um, a Lebanese, uh, Lebanese American um, philosopher, still buttressing the Ubuntu philosophy, says, no human relation gives one possession in another. Every two souls are absolutely different. In friendship or in love, the two side, side by the two side by side, raise hands together to find what one cannot reach alone. There is a concept called the iceberg model, and the iceberg model simply says, states that we are all like floating icebergs. I'm sure everyone of us know what an iceberg is here. Yeah? What sank the Titanic? They tell you. The, even you know my ten-year-old will tell you it's uh, the. It's an iceberg that sank the Titanic. But this concept says we're all like a floating iceberg. If I were to ask you, except for someone you'd know, you know in and out, if I were to ask you to tell me about the beliefs of the man sitting next to you, or to tell me about the thought process running right down in his uh, mind, or tell, you, or tell me about his experience in life, none of you would be able to say it or would be able to tell me, none. But how many times have we run or made assumptions about how to relate, how to interact with someone at face value? And therein lies the problem with effective human relations. The concept of the iceberg model simply states that you must look beyond the 10%, you can see the tip of the iceberg. Look beyond the 10%, and go way down to the 90% you can't see and understand that man, understand his thought process, understand his experiences, his belief system, and therein can you effectively relate with him. In our places of work, you would achieve very little results if very often than not, things are taken at face value and you're not looking at understanding the people you work with. So what is human relations? Now, relationship between employees and management are of what? Substantial value in the workplace. I can tell you for a fact, because oftentimes I'm called as a consultant by organizations to come and run team building programs. Globally, companies spend billions or multi-millions of dollars on team building programs. And what are they trying to achieve? They're trying to achieve what's called team harmony. Because when you have harmony in the team, the results you generate are better. But when you have the harmony in the team, what happens is that results what plummets. And therefore, companies will tend to want to spend more and more and more in achieving team harmony. Ask yourself one question. What have you done in your various roles to engender team harmony and ensure the result within your team is better than what it is, what it was last year? Very important question to ask. So human relations simply talks about whatever an organization or you as an individual who has the power to aid 
the training of an employee, addressing their needs, fostering a workplace culture, and resolving conflict between employees or between um, the employ employee and management. We all play, play, play a very critical role in ensuring that this um, we achieve this level of um, harmony in the workplace. So ultimately, the goal would be for us to work, be able to relate better with each other. And there's this uh, belief that engineers, accountants, auditors, information system auditors also, they don't see people, they just see number, the processes they need to work with. True or false? But you, it, it, there's something we're saying in the HR field, that when you're designing or restructuring an organization, don't see those boxes, don't look at those boxes as, as boxes. Because you know what? They're not boxes. They are people. They're the lives of people. And therefore, when you decide to scrap one position or you scrap the other, you're not just scrapping a box. You're scrapping a human life. And not just a human life, you're scrapping many other people who are dependent on that individual. And therefore, the numbers are not just numbers. The processes, the zero trust, are not just about zero trust. <laughs> but this, the, the trust must also be put in perspective, of course. I wouldn't want anyone calling me and asking me to give um, the first uh, six digits of my ATM card and the last four digits, and I'll foolishly give them. So I still subscribe to uh, you know, zero, zero trust. But in the place of work, we would achieve very little if I don't trust you. You don't trust me. That raises a certain level of defensiveness and would actually be working you know, at uh, different directions. I'm going to run very quickly because of time. Uh, Ivy's already signaling at me that, come on, you know, crack on, crack on, and I'm cracking on. Okay, so what are the critical human relations skills? We're looking at communication. Communication is said to be one of the lifeblood of every organization. How good is the communication within your organization? Or how good is the communication flow between you and your employees? How good is it? How well is it working? I told you to submit the report. Yes, you did, but you never told me the time. But I did to tell you to submit the report. We must be specific when communicating with uh, people. Now, therefore, it's about communicating the accurate, precise message you want the people to have and work with. Because in project environments, in project scenarios, when you do not communicate, one, you express project creep in terms of time, in terms of cost, and so on and so forth. Therefore, communication is of critical um, importance. Empathy. Everyone thinks they are empathetic until they are put in a place where you begin to say to yourself, but I told you my child is sick, and you're saying, the deliverables must be met. So what if your child is ill? Empathy is about putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And it has a strong impact, a strong influence on the level of results you would get within your micro team or within the macro organizational um, team because when people begin to feel we don't care, when people begin to feel the organization doesn't care about us, you know what they do? They begin to sabotage the organization. Naturally, there's something called the law of self-preservation. People want to preserve themselves, want to take care of themselves when they think there's a threat out there. And therefore, if the organization begins to pose a threat to their very existence, they are either defrauding through stealing time or they're defrauding through other means that will eventually hurt the organization. Because they're not going to put, they're not, not, they're not going to be um, mentally engaged anymore. Work can be stressful. And they'll tell you there are two kinds of stress. You have the you stress and you have the negative stress. But with the you stress, it propels you to want to achieve results. But the sort of stress we're talking about is you're, you're being able to identify the signals that are causing you to want to go overboard in either your emotions and how you relate with people. Managing stress is of utmost uh, importance and developing coping mechanisms. And sometimes the coping mechanism could, could actually be as simple as having enough sleep, resting enough. 
you realize that day you don't sleep well. When you get to work, what do you do? You snap at people. The very little thing that you would have overlooked. Oh, please. Oh, please get up. And you eliminate those people who would have supported you in achieving your goal and objective. There can never be an environment devoid of conflict. Even at home. Even the most lovebirds of couples fight. True or true? True. But how do you resolve conflict? From the very get-go, when you identify the differences in perspective, the differences in how we think, the differences in how we want to pursue the methodology to deliver on that project, we need to actually iron out and, and seek for a point of synergy to ensure that these things are done and done in a way that we achieve results. Because where you have conflict in an organization, you're going to be spending the bulk of the time you would have spent delivering on the result, trying to quell that fire. Hours are gone and nothing gets, nothing gets done. Now let me just run quickly through um, how emotional intelligence self Use a, an example of a CEO I once had. The first time I was going to travel, I was starting to go to Canada for it was an intelligence sector. And I flew into Abuja. And uh, you know, Organa CEO is up there, and you know, you know, always have that interaction with him as a um, junior level star. And I introduced myself to him, oh hi, I'm this from this department. Oh hi, he noted my name. And as I was about getting to the vehicle to go off to Kano, he said, Okay, Henry, have a safe trip. You know what that did to me? I mentioned my name to you once. And as I was walking away, you still remembered my name and said what? Have a safe trip. Everyone here, if I were to ask you, on a scale of one to five, tell me how you rate yourself in emotional intelligence. Scale of one to five, let me give you, let's do you know, a quick test. One is poor, two is fair, three is good, four very good, five, excellent. In fact, you're walking on water, excellent. On a scale of one to five, I need you to rate yourself. Tell your neighbor what you think you rate. Two minutes, you've got. What do you rate? Rate yourself, go ahead, go ahead. You've got the liberty. Are you done? I can assure you that most people rated themselves what? Fours, five. You know, guess what, who are you deceiving? You're not there yet. <laughs> now, I didn't say that in a disparaging way. We always tend to, you know, rate ourselves highly in emotional intelligence. But when you see the two dimensions I'm going to walk you through, and a couple of areas you need to ask yourself, am I, how good am I in this area? You realize that for the, for the most part, you'll be trending toward a 2.5 in some areas, a 3 in some areas, a 2 somewhere, rarely a 4, Maybe a four, but rarely a five. Because we're all work in progress, I can assure you. We all know the definition of emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence has two dimensions I want to dwell on. Number one, the personal competence. And the personal competence looks at what? Self-awareness and self-management. You know, for those of us who are working on anger management, um, some of us don't look like angry, grumpy, uh, bunch until something, there's something, something called an emotional trigger. Every one of us has what is called the emotional trigger. For some of us, it's a sense of being cheated or a sense of injustice. For me, if you want to see the other side of me, just disrespect me, treat me like, you know, I don't exist, or show some form of injustice so someone I don't know or care about, you'll see the you know, the animated side of me. And it has actually gotten me into trouble before. It has. And therefore, if I have to rate myself in certain aspects of emotional intelligence, I will give myself a two, a work in progress. Because I must understand this aspect of what? Self-awareness. Self-awareness in the fact that what are some of those things that trigger me into the non-productive side of things? Can I confess, as a very senior person, someone here knows, 
I've actually given someone a slap before. And um, why? Because I just felt, how dare you do that? But that was because I failed to take cognizance of this aspect of me. Self-awareness that I don't like being disrespected. I don't like a sense of injustice. And therefore, if I feel that trigger that says, hey guy, oh yeah, non-productive behavior. I ask myself, if I do this, will I get the result I want or otherwise? And that then comes self-management. When you learn to identify the triggers, those things that trigger you into non-productive mode, and you say to yourself and ask yourself the question, if I were to do this, what would be the end result? And you say the end result would be what? Alter chaos. What should I do? Control yourself. Control your emotions. Do not go, do not go there. And um, you manage that uh, positively. So the other aspect talks about social competence. Even when I know myself and I know the things that trigger me and trigger me positively or negatively, how do I, within my environment, identify those things and either walk away from them or manage the relationship in such a way that I don't become negatively or adversely impacted. And we all have those things that trigger us and set us off on the wrong tangent. And therefore, the two aspects you need to walk away with, understanding and taking advantage of it, knowing fully well about yourself and understanding how you would manage yourself to get the sort of results you want. Because the difference between a productive organization or a productive individual and those that produce less than desired result is often one understanding yourself, understanding how to manage yourself, understanding your environment and the relationship around you. You know, Nigerians are very emotive people. Very emotive, either religious emotiveness or our cultural, uh, our cultural dimension. And therefore, you walk into a work, work environment and you fail to understand the diversity dimensions within there. You would achieve little or nothing in that particular um, environment. And that is very um, crucially, crucially important. I've been seeking now to move on. I've tended to explain uh, what I'm flipping through. And therefore, how do we improve human relations in the work environment? Number one, promote dialogue and communication. Very important. Let people have a sense of we can say how we feel about what is going on. Even within your micro team, can they talk? Or you are the ogre at the top that will never want them to say how they feel and your way must be what? the best way uh, going forward. Number two, focus on company missions and values. Focus on company, when people become distracted and you're thinking of your concerns, um, yesterday Mr. Olutu was talking about um, the, some of the concerns about the power sector. And you realize if we were to get our act together as a country, getting power to run 24 hours in the country is not, much of a big deal. It's about interest. And it's about understanding um, that particular um, sector. So the question we need to ask ourselves, what is the mission? The question the drivers of that sector would have asked, what is the mission of this nation? Is it to remain where we are today? Or to move forward um, as a people? So focus on company mission. Company mission is of what most important in driving, you know, a sense of oneness in the organization and in achieving those results you want to achieve. Help employees feel valuable. When you feel valuable, when people feel valuable, one of the best organizations I worked in, I won't want to mention the name, uh, was in the telecom sector. You always felt like you were contributing because of the way the managers treated those who worked under them. You felt you were a big part of, I mean a small part of the big thing happening in the business. How well do your team members or the people within your micro or the macro team feel they are, you know, making um, inputs or their inputs have been valued and considered as useful in the, in, the, in the scheme of things? Inspire and reward. We must inspire trust. We must inspire, you know, them to want to achieve their 
um, their target, they said target, and target should not be handed down to people, but target should be what negotiated. Oftentimes in companies like um, Google, people are expected and encouraged to set personal target that is tied to their work, um, their work schedule. And that's how come we've had a lot of innovation in that, in that particular direction where things that you're paying money for today was part of someone's pet project as part of his target for achievement um, in that particular financial year. Offer career development. People often think that career development is just tied to senior management, but everyone that manages a team has an impact on someone's career. You could see the person soon and say, you know what, if you focus on this professional exam, professional qualification, you could actually move up as you go on in your career. So we all have a role to play that. And when you do that to people, they have a sense of uh, indebtedness to you and a sense of loyalty to that. You know, I'll give anything, you know, to ensure my boss succeeds. And, and finally, uh, promote healthy work-life balance. It's only in this part of the world that we work, work, work eight days a week. Eight days a week, actually. And you don't rest. You know, we, we tend to create, you know how you get it eight days a week. You know, the work week is uh, you work from eight to nine or nine to five and so on and so forth. But, you know, sometimes you now extend that work hour. This is your sleep time. You now stretch another eight hours or nine hours and after. That becomes eight, you know, eight days a week. Work-life balance is important. En encourage people. Encourage your, um, your team members, your, your colleagues within your work community to, to take care of their health. Because you can only deliver results when you've got good health. If you're sick and you know, um, your health, health is failing, there's very little you can do as a person to achieve what you want to achieve. Now, I've talked about most of these things and therefore would not um, bother um, highlighting. Now, let me go to factors that you know, make a great team. Number one, I've talked about communication. I won't deal, deal with that. Number two is leadership. Leadership isn't about senior management leadership. Leadership is also about each individual taking ownership, even to the gate man. Taking ownership and understanding that the physical security breaches that could happen could affect my job, could cost the business. And therefore, I must have an eye to proactively think about how to combat the security threat for the organization. Trust and respect. We must trust and respect each other that Mr. A, Mr. B would, even though you said, you said zero trust. <laughs> you know, Mr. A and Mr. B, that Mr. A would act in my interest because we're all working towards the same um, goals and objectives. Clear goals. Where you don't have set goals, clear goals for people to work towards, they'll work towards achieving anything far away from the results you wanted from them. Diversity and heterogeneity. Take advantage of the diversity in your workplace. People from different backgrounds, people from different religious perspectives, people who do not believe in what you believe in, and take advantage and make sure you get the most out of it. Manage conflict. Before conflict escalates, we must manage conflict and ensure it doesn't go overboard. So that at the end of the day, you achieve what? From on the, on the, um, on the progression scale of team cohesiveness, you go from what highly cohesive team to what increased self-esteem, increased morale, and then increased performance. Because when the team is highly cohesive, there's a high sense of self-esteem. Everyone feels happy, everyone feels proud of being a part of that um, team or that organization. You wonder why they will tell you um, best employer of the year or best, um, you know, best companies to work for and they list them. Why? There are certain things they put in place to ensure, and some of it involves the way they treat their people, the way they work with their people, the way they ensure that Mr. A does not take advantage negatively um, of Mr. B. And ultimately, if all of this is seen, increased performance is what we would enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I would have liked not to comment, but I think for the benefit of most of us in this room who are public servants, I find it important to, so that we don't go away and everybody is saying, oh, this is theorizing, this is uh, more of theory. What you have said throughout this presentation is ideal. 
But I can tell you in this room, 95% of what you have presented is not practicable in the public sector. So perhaps when we are having this same program next year, you would have done some research on what the ideal is that is being practiced in the, in the private sector. I'm, I'm also an alumni of MTN, so I know most of what you're saying is what we actually did practice in MTN. And I came into public se sector with that ideal status in mind, and actually came in as director of modernization, in organization, and I thought, oh, all this will put into practice. Now, if you go to a document which public sector rely on, it's called public sector rule. Yes, sir. You take the public sector rule and you, 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 you challenge it with what the ideal is. You find out that most of us in public sector are very handicapped and are not going to be able to implement what we have just presented. Thank you. I'm from the private sector, and my question is somewhat related to what she asked, as she noted. How do you intermarry competitiveness amongst your peers and also cooperation when you know that there's only one slot available to be taken by four of you? And bearing in mind that often time, those people that do not play fair are the ones that get the recognition and also the post that is being eyed by the lot. Thank you. That's what you call the micro, and that's what you call the macro. Within the micro, you can do a whole lot. And the micro is about what? Your sphere of influence. As a line manager within your unit, you don't need to consult the public service rule to tell someone, your child that wasn't feeling well, is that child better now? You don't need that. I know you're talking about the very high level changes you need in the public sector, and even BPSR, Bureau for Public Service Reform, in the last maybe 15 or so years, they've tried hard, and they've not really been able to entrench a lot of changes, which is not to say that those changes cannot happen, but it's subject for another day. What I'm promoting here is not what you call in management parlance, revolutionary change. What I'm promoting here is what you call the drip, drip, drip. Drip, drip, drip progressive that makes the change ultimately. If you had 10 line managers in the public sector that dealt with their, their, their employees with a sense of humaneness, and you walk and say to this person, you've been here for five years. You studied accountancy, and I see you work very hard. Have you registered for ICANN? You have talked, you have, you've handled the aspect of what? Career development for them, and therefore, you won't be able to achieve everything you want to achieve. And therefore, I am not theorizing per se, but I'm telling you things that time would fail me to delve into the nitty gritties of some of these things talked about. Like I just said to me, you've got just 30 minutes, you better crack on, you get out of here. And I said, crack on, I will. And therefore, please don't blame me, blame um, ID for. Well, I, I refuse to take the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now, someone said, Competitiveness. Now it's. Um, I understand what you're saying. Amongst colleagues, and it's those that are able to, you know, maneuver their way that get things done. And oftentimes people will say, office politics. Yeah. What we don't understand about office policy, and there was a book I was going to bring here today, called the the new rules of office politics and the new rules of emotional intelligence. Truth is, what you call office politics is practical emotional intelligence. It is not the most intelligent person that gets the job. Yeah. It's the man who understands that that is the boss, that is the king, and therefore is I need to ensure I help him achieve his result. Not I service. <laughs> You see, we over we overstretch the concept of eye service. I can't come to work in the morning and say and ignore my boss in this cultural context. And I say, oh, I'm not greeting him because I schooled in America and it's not a big deal if you don't greet your boss. I mean, we're in a completely different, you know, setting. 
And therefore, what we call eye service is an overstretched concept. Understanding his birthday and when his birthday is, or her birthday, when her birthday is what? Is applying what is called social awareness and relationship management. And therefore, you need to begin to ask yourself, when we say competitiveness in the workplace, we need to come to a point where time will fail me because I've managed various teams. And it, it came to a point where at the forming stage of that team, we were all at loggerheads. And I was a team lead. And towards the end, no one plans to leave the team without coming to seek for my advice and saying, I'm going for this position. How do I go about it? Because we've all come to understand that there will be opportunities that will show up to, today, tomorrow, that we will all compete for. But whoever gets it, got it because probably they prepared better. And preparing better is not about knowing the context of the job alone, but knowing the context of the organization and those that push how things get done. Let's be real. We're in the real world. I, I don't think I've answered your question um, fully, but um, that's what I can say for now. All right. Thank you very much, Henry. Let's give him a round of applause. So I think everyone here picked up something. If you're a board member and you have a ticket, it's not allowed. IPP said he's going to win something, and I disagree with him. <laughs> Does everyone have a ticket? Oh, so where were you? Okay. Um, should we allow them? Because we said if we shared at that time, that was it. Is it will be <laughs> okay? So let's let's just get. Can you just keep your hands up so that we'll make sure everybody has a fair chance? Can you get the other? Okay, no. <laughs> okay, there were rules, right? Okay, so we shouldn't allow them participate. Is that? Oh, zero trust. <laughs> Please, can you be fast? But they're also participants, so let's just allow them. Zero trust, but they are. They are professional. Yes. Uh, I believe that they are men of integrity. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Because we just want everyone to have one, um, one ticket. Just one. So that's why we wanted everybody to take it at the same time. Who is getting there? Please be fast. Okay. So it's just going to be where we pick it. Okay, she has it. Well, who picked number 35? Number 35. Number 35. It's not in the room. Going? <laughs> okay, gone. So let's have another one. Okay, so, um, so for the first and the second uh, prizes, we'll have a tab to give. And then the third one, we have um, a Bluetooth earpiece. And then the consolation prize is also a Bluetooth earpiece. Yes. We are starting from the... The first, yes. The, no, the Bluetooth. Yes. The, the last part, the, the consolation oh, prize. Oh, okay. So how do you want to do it? Let's start from the front. Okay, bottom four. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Okay, so let's do bottom four. Is that 
Okay. Now tell me where to stop shaking. Right? Oh, yeah, stop now. Okay. There you go. Okay. Number 89. Who has number, number 89? 89. Number 89. Not here again. Number 89. Are you sure of the Going. Going. Oh, this is strange. What's happening? Okay. What do you win? I agree with you, sir. Alright, again. Yes. This is um no, this is like the holder. Yes. Because I was surprised. Myself. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, this is ninety-eight. I can say eighty-six. No, this is ninety-eight. Number ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. Is that not the many? The many. Uh, no, look at the remaining one. Why are you waving your hand? What's happening? As in not speak. Why do we have the words not picked inside here? <laughs> That's what I want you to do. Let's keep going. Let's check the algorithm. Okay, so let's keep going, yes. Sorry for the time, please. We'll just try to make this as quick as possible. Uh, we we'll have to keep going. There's no other way. It's already here. You should find where? Here? No, no boy. Okay, I'll shake, shake, shake. Tell where to stop. It's all right. It's all right. All right. Somebody should win, please. 71. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> A round of applause. Good. One winner. You have broken the jeans. <laughs> no, Bluetooth. Yeah. This is the Bluetooth. It's supposed to be down up, right? Okay, so Mr. Lotto, could you help us, sir, yes. to hand over the prizes? So when you win, you hand over to yourself, sir. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Dedeke. Thank you from the members of the organizing committee. Thank you for coming. Yes, congratulations. Thank you so much and congratulations. All right. Okay. Okay. Shake, okay. shake, 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 shake. When do I stop? Stop. Thank you. There you go. Okay. 61. 61. 61. Who is that? 61. Where is it? 61. Okay. Oh, give a round of applause. So, could you just remain here? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Welcome. Is this your first time attending the conference? Oh, okay. All right. Good. Congratulations. From the planning committee. Thank you for coming. Show the top. Show the top. Show the top. Round of applause. Okay, so um, we have the last two prizes, which are Samsung tabs. And uh, I wish that everyone will get it. Okay. Shake, 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 shake. Oh, okay. 120. 120. 120. Going. Going. Gone. Alright. Shake, 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 shake. Shake, 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 shake. Is that right? I would have won something. I'm always very lucky. I always win draws, yes. But I'm disqualified. Disqualified. 101. One zero one. 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 Going. Oh, we we'll have a winner. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations, sir. Yeah. Let's see you again. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, on behalf of um, the planning committee for the conference, we thank you for coming and um, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and it's only been guys. The thing is, what's happening now? That's what I was just saying.
This is not nice. You have to do some. Uh... <laughs> and I'm the conference chair. Shake, 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 shake. Okay, so now the first prize. Um, let's see who gets this. Oh wow! You won't believe this. Number one. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh congratulations, sir. And on behalf of the planning committee. Please, can we have all the people who got the raffle just take a picture? With their prizes proudly displayed, please. Let's just do it very fast. Well, let's take our picture now. Sorry, sir. Yes, please. Thank you. Sir. All right, join, join, join. We do. Hey, come on, come on, come on. That's the guy. Okay. Okay. Let me stand on this side. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh -huh. Can we have the. What's it? Just me. See what you have. Uh, sorry, sorry, can we move? Can we move? Let's climb this thing. Okay. To climb this thing? Yes, let's climb this thing. We're not having enough space. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so that's um, that's about that. If we were not lucky this time. They only only the guys took everything, and uh, the ladies are protesting. Okay, I'll do something about that. And um, we're gradually um, coming to the end of this meeting. I want to believe it's been worth the while um, since Monday for those who were here for the pre-conference workshop. Um, we discussed uh, forensic audit and data analytics. And uh, Tuesday we started off with the conference, and uh, here we are Thursday, just about to to round up. And um, I must sincerely thank everyone who has um, been a part of this, who has uh, participated in this conference, regardless of what we put together, regardless of the speakers we bring, the topics that we're discussing. If we don't have people in this room, it all doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. So I'm very glad that everyone came and we all um, had the patience to wait up to this time. So I just want to just give us a few, um, a few things and then we'll close with lunch. Um, we, have, we probably have not done everything right, would have done some things good. And so we um, ask that you should um, please help us fill our feedback forms. Just like the Google Forms you filled for the registration, can you put it up here? Um, please just help us fill the feedback forms. It's easier for us to collate soft copies, so we're not going to be having the hard copy feedback forms. It will also be on the WhatsApp um, platform. If you also go to the website, um, isakabuja.org, you will also find it here. Please, I will want every one of us to fill those feedback forms. It's very um, important that you do so, so that we will draw lessons from this event, so that we can make subsequent, subsequent ones um, better. We want to, what do you want to hear in the next conference? What topics do you want us to be discussing? Which speakers you know, do you want to see? Let's just have all of that on that feedback, so that we can um, use that in subsequent planning. And. Um, I don't want us to live here just um, like that. I want you to, I'm, I'm sure in the course of the three days you would have networked with a lot of people. Get cards, you know, get um, contacts of people so that when, you know, you have that issue or the other with your work, you can easily reach out to somebody, um, to the speakers we have here. Just, you know, get their contacts. That's the whole essence. We provide the platform and then you leverage it for your um, network. And then, um, I want to thank uh, the partners, the people who helped us to, you know, be able to fund this event. Um, they have really uh, 
it's by the sponsorship that we're able to also put this together. I want to thank uh, the committee members, the work tireless. Like I can tell you that this took a lot of hours and they're not getting paid for it. They just like what they're doing and they have you know, covered different aspects of this program and we've been able to you know, get it this far. I also thank the program anchors, Mr. Uta, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Bakari, Mrs. Gloria, um, I thank you so very much. And then I want to thank um, the board members. They've also been very supportive. Um, the board currently led, 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 led by Mr. Glory. Mr. Glory has been, uh, he has been a very strong support. He always has one advice, one thing to say, and then you know we just get this whole thing do, um, running. Again, I know they are not here, my family, but I really want to thank them. Um, this has taken so much time, so much hours, and they've been very, very supportive. Sometimes when I'm going, my daughter, my, the youngest one, she's about age, she just says, Mommy, you're going to Isaka again. I say, yes, I'm going to Isaka again. So um, I uh, am happy for having the time to, to do this. And then I also want to thank each and every participant again and again. I can't thank you enough. Um, because.